In February 2022, Vladimir Putin's invasion plan backfired. Despite repeated attempts, Russian forces weren't able to take Kyiv within days like Putin thought, and in a span of a few months they were pushed back into Ukraine's eastern Donbass region. Many have now come to take the prowess of the Ukrainian armed forces for granted, forgetting that it required a combination of luck, skill, and strategy, along with staggering Russian incompetence, to bring the conflict to where it stands today. Now, with another Ukrainian counteroffensive on the horizon, let's take a look back at just how Ukraine managed to prevent Russian victory on day one. The invasion began early in the morning on February 24, 2022. At 5 a.m. local time, Putin gave a televised speech where he announced his decision to launch a so-called special military operation in Ukraine. In the speech, Putin stated Russia would seek the demilitarization and denazification of Ukraine and that all responsibility for possible bloodshed will be entirely on the conscience of the regime ruling in the territory of Ukraine. Zelensky's government was framed as neo-Nazis under NATO control who were developing nuclear weapons to strike at Russia. As justification for an invasion, Putin declared the need to protect the people of Donbas, who he falsely claimed had been facing humiliation and genocide perpetrated by the Kyiv regime. Only minutes after Putin's speech, explosions were reported in Kyiv, Kharkiv, Odessa and the Donbas region. This massive barrage of caliber cruise missiles rained down across the country, destroying a substantial number of Ukraine's air defense sites and radars. When combined with electronic warfare attacks, this onslaught gave Putin one of his only real victories in the war, disrupting Ukraine's dense air defense network and very briefly giving Russia air superiority. Close to the same time Russian troops had landed in Mariupol and nearby areas, while more Russian crews and ballistic missiles struck military command posts, airfields and ammunition depots in places like Kyiv, Kharkiv and Dnipro. At the same time, videos showed Russian military vehicles crossing the border from Belarus as well as Russian annexed Crimea. In an initial sign of cohesion, top Ukrainian officials responded very quickly to the attack. Ukrainian Interior Minister Denis Monastirsky woke up to frantic calls informing him of the Russian advance. He immediately called President Zelensky, telling him that it has started. In an interview, he later recalled that in the first minutes, they delivered terrible blows to our air defense, terrible blows to our troops in general. There were 20-meter craters, the likes of which no one has seen in their lifetimes. The Kremlin's initial plan seemed to be targeting Ukraine's command and control centers with everything they could muster, while using a blitzkrieg strategy with helicopters and fighter jets to quickly obtain air superiority. Faced with this onslaught, almost no experts or analysts believed Ukraine had a chance. The Center for Naval Analyses said Russia would use a so-called pincer movement to surround Kyiv and cut off Ukraine's forces in the east. If it had been a success, as most assumed it would, this would have allowed Russian forces to remove the Ukrainian government and kill or force the surrender of all those isolated from the capital. The Center for Strategic and International Studies identified three axes of the Russian advance, from Belarus in the north, from Donetsk in the center, and from Crimea in the south, arguing that in each Russian troops would overwhelm defenders in days. Even governments supportive of Ukraine gave them little chance. US intelligence suggested that Russia intended a decapitation strike on Ukraine's government and that Kyiv would most likely fall within 96 hours. Later that same day, Russian forces began large-scale amphibious offensives near Kharkiv and Mariupol, where more troops poured in from the Belarusian border. These Russians pressed into the exclusion zone around the defunct Chernobyl nuclear plant, where the head of the Ukrainian border guard sector, Vitaly Yavorsky, would later find evidence that they had dug trenches in radioactive soil and eaten contaminated deer they shot in the nearby woods. Intense fighting broke out all throughout the east of the country, with Russian troops steadily advancing toward Kyiv. In the strikes, more than two dozen Mi-8s entered Ukrainian airspace. These transport helicopters carried over 100 of Russia's most elite air assault troops, supposed to be the very best of the Russian military. Alongside the Mi-8s were a small fleet of Ka-52 attack helicopters, meant to provide escort security and fire support. Deployed from an airbase in Belarus, they traveled over 150 miles and had already been in the air when Putin announced his invasion. Attempting to avoid what air defense remained intact, the choppers flew fast and low, skimming the treetops above Ukrainian towns and villages. Their target was Hostomel Airport, also known as Antonov Airfield, a major hub outside of Kyiv. Controlling the airport would have allowed Russia to fly in thousands of its troops directly to the capital, allowing Putin to carry out the decapitation strike against the government of Vladimir Zelensky. 
but right from the get-go, not everything went as planned. The first major mistake of the assault on Hostomel was limited Russian equipment. Ideally, such an attack would have been carried out before dawn to catch defending troops unaware. But even Russia's elite air assault teams lacked the proper night vision equipment to do so and were forced to begin the attack at sunrise. However, this left the Ukrainian defenders with a clear view of the attacking force, something they took advantage of. As the helicopters made their approach over the tree line from the Dnieper River, they were immediately attacked by Ukrainian machine guns, small arms fire, and shoulder-mounted surface-to-air rockets or man pads. Throughout the first days of the invasion, man pads such as the US-produced Stinger would prove critical to the defense of Kyiv and other major cities. Relatively light and portable at 35 pounds, the Stinger missile system is also highly accurate. Using an infrared seeker to lock onto the heat in an engine's exhaust and able to hit nearly anything flying below 11,000 feet. While other Ukrainian shoulder-mounted missile systems are not as effective, their combined effect on Russian air power was staggering. On the morning of the 24th, the Russian helicopters countered by deploying flares, but several Mi-8s were recorded taking fire and hitting the water. At least one Ka-52 was shot down, crashing into the far riverbank as its two pilots ejected. At the same time, five Mikoyan MiG-29s from the Ukrainian 40th Tactical Aviation Brigade also intercepted the formation. These jets reportedly shot at least two more helicopters and harassed the Russian air support needed for the landing. When they arrived at Hostomel, Russian troops prepared for an airborne landing by striking the airport with more rockets, some of them destroying Ukraine's air defenses. One defender who witnessed the initial barrage stated they opened fire at anything within reach, all the buildings, at any people they saw moving around, regardless of whether they were military or civilians, they didn't care, they were just firing wherever they detected movement. Ukrainian officials would also later conclude that an airport employee was working for Russian intelligence, revealing their hidden positions. But while the targeted rocket barrage did provide cover for troop landings, it failed to significantly weaken the other air defenses surrounding the airport, something which would become important later. But Russian troops soon made their landing and began to try to capture the airport, expecting only light resistance and a relatively quick surrender. The roughly 300 Ukrainian defenders of Hostomel were even more under-equipped, and many were recent conscripts who had never seen battle. Because of these factors, their resistance was limited, and they were steadily pushed back by the advancing Russians, but they didn't give up. With one National Guardsman, Serhii Faletuk, successfully shooting down a Russian helicopter with a 9K-38 Igla and boosting the spirits of the conscripts. By midday, however, the Ukrainian defenders were overwhelmed, and Russia was able to take the airport, where its troops began preparing for airlifts of fresh troops. But then things started to go very wrong. Despite overcoming the initial defenders at the airport, Russian troops continued to take fire from armed local civilians all around the airport, while Ukraine began to bombard the position with heavy artillery. Then, at a critical moment of the battle, a large-scale Ukrainian counterattack was launched by the 4th Rapid Reaction Brigade of the National Guard, backed by the Ukrainian Air Force. Lacking armored vehicles, the Russian forces were dependent on air support to hold off the Ukrainian advances. In an effort to push back the counterattack, two Russian Su-25 fighter jets also began to attack Ukrainian positions, but they were met by those Ukrainian planes which survived the first missile barrages, at least two Su-24s and a MiG-29. This aerial dogfight gave Ukraine more time to rush in ground forces to the airport, which included elite units from the Georgian Legion and Ukrainian air assault forces. Amid all this fighting, the planes carrying fresh Russian reinforcements could not land and were forced to turn around and head back north. These massive Ilyushin 76S transports would have been critical to a quick Russian capture of the airport, allowing them to create a foothold and stop Ukrainian defenders from overwhelming the temporary Russian positions. The fact that they were not able to land was one of the first major turning points in the war and would be catastrophic for the Russian attack on Kyiv. Heavy fighting ensued around Hostomel for the rest of the day. By the early evening, Ukrainian units were able to surround the airport. Without the reinforcements Russia needed, its troops were essentially penned down, and many of those who remained were pushed into the forests outside the airport to try to take cover. And by this point, it was also clear that Ukrainian soldiers and their allies would fight to the last man and employ any tactics necessary to overcome their quantitative disadvantages. Georgian Legion commander Mamuka Mamulashvili later claimed that when his men ran out of ammunition in the battle, he actually used his car to run over retreating Russian paratroopers. 
Sporadic fighting continued throughout the night until early the next morning. Then Russian reinforcements coming from Belarus, along with another air assault, were able to break through the Ukrainian defenses around the airport. While some of the ground convoys were ambushed, enough made it through to push out the Ukrainians from Hostomel. When it became clear they would have to temporarily give up the airport, Ukraine sabotaged much of the airport, blowing holes in the runway to stop Russian planes from landing. So, while Russian troops were in control of Hostomel, the airport was too badly damaged to be of much value, something which likely made all the difference in stopping Putin's lightning attack. Ukraine would regain control of the airport by April 2nd, but their initial resistance to Russian advances was a vital moment, which would set the tone for the rest of the conflict. Throughout the next few weeks, the airport would be used as a Russian ammunition depot and forward operating base, but the runway remained too damaged to land on. While it took until late March, Russia was eventually forced to flee Hostomel. In their hasty retreat, Russian troops destroyed much of their own equipment, while other material was captured intact by the Ukrainians. In addition, other Russian equipment had been destroyed by Ukrainian artillery strikes before the withdrawal. Overall, Russia lost at least seven armored fighting vehicles, 23 infantry fighting vehicles, three armored personnel carriers, one anti-aircraft gun, two field artillery pieces, three helicopters, as well as 67 trucks, vehicles, and jeeps at Antonov Airport. Elsewhere in Ukraine, the same pattern of unexpected resistance was taking place during the first days of the war. While Russian troops advancing from Crimea entered the city of Kherson late in the day on the 24th, they continued to take heavy fire from multiple directions. They were able to take control of the North Crimean Canal, allowing them to resume water flow to the peninsula, but experienced overwhelming hostility from the locals. Kherson would later become another critical point of Ukrainian resistance, depriving Putin of the easy victory he seemed to think he was assured. Several other instances of Ukrainian resistance would take place on the invasion's first day. One of these was in the Black Sea, on the tiny spit of land known as Snake Island. Located roughly 30 miles off the coast, Snake Island is strategically important, allowing whoever controls it to blockade Odessa and dominate large parts of the Black Sea. The Russian Navy attacked the island, expecting its tiny garrison of defenders to simply lay down their weapons and surrender. But the attack soon went viral and became an iconic symbol of Ukraine's determination. The Russian cruiser Moskva began to fire on the garrison, demanding their surrender. Instead, Ukrainian border guard Roman Hrybov famously responded with the phrase, Russian warship, yourself. This was emblematic of Ukraine's refusal to give up, helping to fuel the defenders' determination. As news of Russian brutality and Ukrainian heroism spread like wildfire, there was intense resistance across the country by the morning of February 25th. Most observers still assumed that Russia could take Kyiv through overwhelming force, especially as tank columns miles long rolled toward the city. But much like Hostomel, Kherson, and Snake Island, the determination and clever tactics employed by the defenders had a serious impact. In particular, General Colonel Oleksandr Sirsky, in charge of Ukraine's ground troops, executed his ambushes masterfully. Initially shocked by the speed and scale of the invasion, Sirsky quickly adapted. He determined that to reach the capital, the Russian tanks would need to use only two or three major highways. So his forces were arrayed in two rings, one in the outer suburbs and one within the city. Designed to keep artillery and tank fire as far from most civilians as possible, he divided the city and surrounding region into sectors, assigning experienced generals to lead each and establishing a clear chain of command, where tactical decisions could be made on the spot without asking headquarters. Due to these decisions, Russian forces in the north of the country were heavily engaged by these elements of the Ukrainian military, especially as long tank columns began to really suffer from the ambushes. Ukrainians hiding in ditches, bushes, and abandoned buildings throughout the suburbs of Kyiv used anti-tank missiles and mines to trap Russian armor in kill zones where they could not retreat. Once tanks in the rear had been blown up, the defenders then called down artillery strikes on the trapped columns. By repeating this tactic multiple times, Ukraine was able to massively slow the Russian advance with comparatively few casualties. As an investigation by the Washington Post would later conclude, the defenders would also take advantage of terrain around the capital, dense forests, narrow roads, winding rivers that favored their guerrilla tactics, as well as weather short of freezing that thawed the land and bogged down Russian vehicles. In response, as Russian forces approached Kyiv, they deployed specialized Spetsnaz units to try and infiltrate the capital and hunt for government officials. At the same time, both Chechen special forces and Wagner Group mercenaries made several attempts to assassinate Zelensky. 
But remarkably, according to Ukrainian intelligence, these efforts were stopped by anti-war officials in Russia's FSB, who shared intelligence of the plans. While managing to avoid these groups, Zelensky's government asked residents of the city to prepare Molotov cocktails, while distributing over 18,000 guns to those willing to defend their homes. Throughout the day, fighting intensified in the Kyiv suburbs. By the evening, the Pentagon stated that Russia had not established air superiority over Ukrainian airspace. As U.S. analysts had predicted, Ukrainian air defense capabilities had been pummeled by Russian attacks, but remained operational. The Pentagon also assessed that Russian troops were not advancing as quickly as either U.S. intelligence or Moscow had believed they would, that Russia had not taken any population centers, and that Ukrainian command and control was still intact. These facts were among the first real signs that the war was not playing out as anticipated, and that Ukraine could possibly hold its own. Similarly, Russian forces had still failed to take or even encircle Kyiv by the end of the day. Experts from the Institute for the Study of War (ISW) reported that poor planning and execution was already leading to issues with logistics and morale for the Russian troops in the north of Ukraine. According to U.S. and U.K. intelligence, a major reason for this was that Russian forces faced shortages of gasoline and diesel fuel, leading to tanks and armored vehicles stalling and slowing their advance. Combined with the effectiveness and asymmetric costs of Ukraine's ambush tactics, these first two days of the war ensured that Ukraine was able to hold its own until military aid from the West began to arrive. Many experts have since reflected on the significance of these early stages of the war, particularly around Kyiv and Hostomel. Security analyst Andrew McGregor described the battle for Hostomel Airport as a Russian airborne disaster. It would become clear later that the entire Russian strategy hinged on early control of the airport, allowing them to surge into Kyiv and end the war in a matter of days. But Russian intelligence had failed to assess the number and determination of Ukrainian defenders around the airport, and assumed it would take limited fire. But that didn't happen, and when the initial landing force was too small to hold the area, the Russian military was unable to secure air transport for reinforcements as well as prevent Ukrainian counterattacks. Other experts have expressed similar ideas. The Atlantic Council argues that Ukraine's ability to defend the airport for two whole days possibly prevented a rapid capture of Kyiv, while another expert noted that it broke the back of the Russian assault. Researcher Severin Player had suggested that the Battle of Antonov Airport showcased the Russian military's general failures during the invasion, including difficulties with main weapon systems, failures in logistics coordination and planning, as well as a lack of leadership and training. According to him, the fighting for the airport also highlighted that the Russian battalion tactical groups are not well suited for warfare, as they hinder coordination and communication, and because Russia was totally unprepared for the ferocity of the Ukrainian defense, their blitzkrieg turned into a drawn-out siege and a counter-siege. As a result, the attacking force was only able to seize the target at a later date when it had become much less strategically significant, resulting in major issues for the overall Russian plan of attack. But perhaps just as important as the tactical benefits of Ukraine's early resistance was the psychological effect it created. Journalist Andreas Rusch had argued that the Battle of Antonov Airport, alongside the other early battles during the invasion, disproved the myth of the capabilities and near-invincibility of the Russian airborne forces. These claims, which had been extensively fostered by propaganda in Russia and reinforced by rosy analyses from military experts around the world, while more than a year of war has now made it obvious that Russia's military is not all it was hyped up to be, it was the fierce Ukrainian resistance which destroyed the facade. And none of this would have been possible without those first remarkable days, where a combination of grit, tactics, and luck enabled Ukraine to hold its ground. Due to all the factors, the war has been raging for more than a year, rather than the few days which Putin believed it would last. So what do you think? How critical were the first days of the war? And what does it tell us about where it might be going this year? Let us know in the comments below. And don't forget to subscribe for more military content and analysis.